I knew that competing isn't about health, you guys. It's about competing. I wasn't ready to compete because I wasn't mentally or physically healthy yet. And I knew I had greater priorities at the moment. Is bodybuilding about selfies, steroids, magazines, and muscles? How do I become a successful pro bodybuilder or fitness competitor? Where do I even start if I'm new? And the biggest question of all, what are the judges looking for anyway? Even today with the internet, many people first discover bodybuilding by word of mouth. The lack of regulation has caused a boom of unqualified coaches, scattered info, biased advice, dangerous protocols, and posing trends that are a hot mess. After 20 years in the business, I have seen it all. Week after week, I'm going to talk about taboo topics that get swept under the rug, provide you tips and strategies to gain a competitive edge and stand out on stage in any division or federation. I'm going to answer all the burning industry questions without the bias. I have competed across six federations, earned pro status in three, and judged in two. I've coached posing and choreography for men and women in all federations and divisions. I know just how much competing means to you. I'm your host, Michelle Welcome, and you are listening to the Everything Else in Bodybuilding podcast. Be sure to download your free guide, Five Things Every Bodybuilder and Fitness Competitor Needs to Know Before Your Next Show at eeinbb.com. That's www.eeinbb.com. I remember one of my show preps, there was so much buzz around the gym leading up to the show. It was so motivating to feel that support and encouragement every day. The day before I left for the Pro World Championships, I was surprised with a, a good luck video that included video clips from a bunch of members in the gym, giving me personal good luck messages. I had never been so moved in my entire life. Like, who does that? I didn't win that show, but it didn't matter. They treated me like a celebrity anyways. The road leading up to that competition was a lot of fun. Backing my way out of the show was a lot less fun, naturally. The competition was over, the buzz was over, and it was time to take the feedback I got from the judges and go back to the drawing board. The aftermath is the part that, if you're planning to compete more than just once as a bucket list item, is equally as important as the actual competition itself. And I don't care what level you're competing on, there is always room for improvement. Post-show is really where the magic happens, when the improvements happen, if you let it. If you're too caught up in yourself and what you looked like on show day and obsessing about keeping that physique, then you are prolonging the improvements. Eventually, you will crash. Hardcore dieting, whatever diet that is, is not sustainable. If you are smart, you take constructive feedback and start thinking like a competitor, someone who wants to win, get better, improve, and focus on the things that will move the needle in that direction. Post-show, is your mindset needs to go from being attached to your show physique and shift it to thinking more competitively. By the way, the show day itself goes by with like a blink of an eye. Those of you that have competed for before know what I'm talking about. You prepare for this day for months, and everything about it is on your mind constantly. Often when the day itself comes, it's a long day. It's often cold backstage, so cold, so you're freezing, and it's a lot of waiting around all day. And at some point, you might even say to yourself that you can't wait for it to be over. And before you know it, it is over. And all that focus you just had leading up to the show needs to be recalibrated into a post-show mindset. So moral of this is there has to be more to wanting to compete than just being all about the day itself or the trophy. Like that video my gym members made for me. That was more of a memorable moment than the show itself. An assessment of your mindset and overall stability in life is the first thing you can do to determine whether you should compete or not. And this goes for both new and, and veterans because these things can change from unforeseen circumstances. Things you don't see coming will test your faith and your strength. If your mindset isn't prepared to compete, you shouldn't compete. Competing should only happen when your financial, emotional, and overall life stability are all in a good place. Let me give you an example of when it's not. And I hate talking about this time in my life because it brings me back to a dark place I really don't like to remember, but it's a part of what has built me to who I am today, so I'll share it. I'm a veteran, as you know, but I'm not perfect. I've earned pro status in three different federations, and you know what? Life happens. Plus, one of you listening might be feeling down in the dumps today and maybe need to hear that everything's going to be okay. So about five or six years ago, I didn't think I was going to compete again. 
I was going through a very difficult time in my personal life and survival became my number one goal. I thought about competing here or there, but I knew that I did not have the mental capacity. Hear me again. I did not have the mental capacity to balance show prep with my everyday life. In fact, during this time, you guys, I hit an all-time low. I was like 50. All right, let's be real. I was like 60 pounds overweight and eating and drinking every day were my only comforts. And one day I ended up in the hospital, you guys, with pain in the middle of my back that was so severe. And I kid you not, I couldn't sit, stand, lie down. There was absolutely no making it comfortable. I put ice packs on my back. I dug massagers into my back. Nothing gave me comfort. And when my fever hit 140 degrees, I knew I had to go to the hospital. So here I am in the hospital in the ER. The ER doc finds fluid in my lungs. Like, okay. And immediately puts me on broad spectrum antibiotics. I will never forget this giant needle. It was like a fun size needle that was used to extract the fluid from my back. I remember seeing, seeing the needle and be like, you're going to do what with that? <laughs> I remember during the hospital stay while they're trying to manage my fever, I would wake up hallucinating and screaming from crazy nightmares, like the most bizarre nightmares. I've, I just can't even describe them. They were like cartoonish. And I remember a team of people rushing to my bedside to stack tons of ice packs on me to try and cool my fever down. I was in the hospital for a week, and to this day, they never figured out what caused the fever or the fluid in my lungs. When they analyzed the fluid, it came up empty. I was tested for everything. And nope, wasn't pneumonia. They even tested me for things like Lyme disease, you name it. They tested me, and everything came up fine. This low was an eye-opener for me. I knew that I wasn't taking care of myself and needed a change. At this time, I, I would look at my contest pictures and truly I would cry about how far I fell from my goals. I had worked so hard to get there and I just couldn't believe I had, it was like a, my eyes opened and went, holy crap, what the hell have I been doing? And it was very humbling and humiliating to have to start over. I felt like I was starting over in every area of my life. I thought about competing again during this time, because that's something I very much enjoyed. And I said, no, I didn't want to use a show as a goal to get myself back to healthy. I knew that competing isn't about health, you guys. It's about competing. I wasn't ready to compete because I wasn't mentally or physically healthy yet. And I knew I had greater priorities at the moment. So instead, I, I told myself I'm stronger than this and took my health back one day at a time. At first, I just did things at the gyms that I enjoyed. Just being there was better than the day before, so in my mind, I was winning. I purposely did no cardio during this time to not teach my body to need it. Any change I made would be better. I lifted maybe three days a week at first, and, and at first I could only handle 20 minutes and maybe two to three sets of exercises because my cardiovascular health was in the toilet. But over time, my cardiovascular system did improve, my strength came back, and eventually, eventually, so did my motivation to want to compete again. But I still knew this was far out, and I refused to make it a goal and instead just took it day by day. During this time of taking my health back, I purposely kept Dove Dark Chocolates in the kitchen cabinet and had them as dessert every night. I might even have grabbed a Dove Dark Chocolate and maybe scooped out some peanut butter on it. Mmm, so good. Again, this wasn't about deprivation. I wasn't trying to make a quick fix. I knew from years of competing, okay, from years of competing, I knew it's the slow crawls that reap the longest benefits, that change takes time and consistency, and that, you guys, Four Dove chocolates a day weren't going to kill my progress. Every day was better already. Lack of consistency would kill my progress, not the Dove dark chocolates. In fact, keeping the Doves in my nutrition and still losing all the weight, I knew, I knew it would have a positive effect on my mental well-being. You see, if you don't feel deprived, you won't stress about being deprived. I can eat a couple bites of a dessert today and count it in my calories for the day and and really just not freak out that I had a couple bites of something. Like, okay, a couple bites, no big deal. Stressing about food and then going on a month-long bender, eating the foods you think are bad and hating yourself afterwards, now that is far less healthy, if you ask me. If it's trackable and I stay within my goal macros for the day, it's on plan. It took me a couple years to balance all these things out, 
yeah, I said years, but it did happen. And as you know, if you've been following me here now, I'm currently 18 weeks out from my next competition. The progress has been slow, but I feel zero angst. This isn't my first rodeo with show prep in life. This detached from perfection mindset allows me to focus on other things that need my attention, like my curriculums that I've built to help all competitors fill in the gaps that keep them from feeling confident with their posing. Check it out, posingwinshows.com if you haven't. It took me years to get back to a healthy weight and mindset, and that's okay. Taking care of me was worth it, and so is it for you. Shows will always be there, but your health should always come first. Which leads me to your relationship with food and exercise is another determining factor on whether you should compete. One thing I can say happens the most from my experience over the past 20 years in the industry is people's relationship with their body changes forever when they do a show. This goes for you men too. You will love being ripped. I know you do. If you're a competitor, think about it for a moment. How many times do you show your contest pictures and say, this is what I really look like? I've heard that saying quite often. The funny thing is, you look like that for like one or two weeks, like five seconds, you guys, and then dialed back out of the show to a healthier body fat level. So no, that is not the real you. The reality is something that takes a long time for some people to come to terms with this reality. So, and then some never do. Some never recover from finally achieving the body of their dreams and not being able to keep it year round. This is not everyone though. I mean, some people are naturally lean and stay that way year round. I'm talking them about the ones that aren't, and I know there's a lot of you. This sport also attracts many with eating disorders, which can be both a good and a bad thing. It can be really good for someone who has had a fear of eating and then for the first time finds positive reinforcement from eating when their body starts to morph into a more fit and healthy shape that they like. I've seen some top-level pros share some seriously disturbing before pics of them suffering from anorexia and bulimia before they found fitness, like WBFF fitness model champion Hattie Boydell from Australia. She comes to mind, and, and so does IFBB Bikini, Bikini Olympia champion Issa Pacini from Brazil. Both are at the top of the sport, and they stay fit and healthy year-round despite competing. So why do some people fall apart after a show and others who have every reason to fall apart and develop body image issues avoid a post-show disaster? I can't speak for the exact protocols of people, so let me put that disclaimer out there. I can only speculate and offer insight from my own experiences as, as both a competitor and as a posing coach with clients that they come to me from all different contest prep coaches from all different walks of life. So I hear a lot. I see a lot. And of course, I've experienced a lot. I think one major determining factor on whether someone will fall apart after a show and develop body image issues is quite simple. It comes down to the protocol they follow when preparing for their first set of shows, how they prepared for that show. This protocol either comes from their own research or from a contest prep coach they hire. One of my first shows of this podcast was about the death of credibility. I talked all about contest prep coaches and how anyone that can type the word coach, <laughs> they can say they're a coach on social media. And because of this, there are a lot of people who struggle with not just mental health, but physical health after a show that should never have had to. Never. There is absolutely no reason for it. They could have dialed into a show and a, more times than not, they probably could have looked better too. So with a different protocol, that is. So having said that, I've summarized three types of contest prep protocols used to prepare for a show. Are you ready? Okay, here's protocol number one. Here we go. Cuts a ton of carbs right away, no matter how far out the show is. You lose a quick five pounds and are hooked, but progress hits a plateau, so it must be because of carbs. At some point, carbs are barely there or non-existent. Eating fruit means getting second place. Tons of cardio is a must, too. It might even get up to two or three hours a day. Bonus points for your hair falling out. Protocol number two. Includes PEDs, regardless of whether this is your first show or how long you've been training. The supplement list is nonchalantly included with your nutrition and training protocol. You think this is normal because the coach touts having turned more people into pros than everyone else, so you go with it. Don't know any different. Body changes happen quick, which is exciting. Some other weird things happen to your body in phase two, but you don't think much of it because you are, quote unquote, trusting the process. And then protocol number three. Long and slow descent into a show with a coach who might actually have a PhD in nutrition or exercise. Ooh, what a concept. Coach might not look the part, okay, or have hundreds or thousands of followers either. 
lots of science is involved, might even include diet breaks. Changes in macros can be as small as 20 grams of carbs and ample time given to let the changes to the body take effect. No dramatic weight loss for an ego boost. Facts are greater than your feelings. Think about this for a moment. Which of these three protocols do you think are less likely to encourage a post-show shitstorm? Let's talk about number one. Teaches you to think carbs are going to ruin your physique, so you try to keep them to a minimum post-show too. You build an unhealthy relationship to carbs too. Also, two hours of cardio is hard to maintain, but your body has adapted to this level of output. But you don't have a goal grand enough to keep you motivated to do all that cardio. Plus, you are trained to think that cardio is key to show prep. There is so much that can go wrong with post-show with this protocol that can impact your relationship to food and nutrition for years. You might just say, fuck it, and eat whatever you want post-show. You might never do a show again, or you might do shows as a way to chase the physique you had on stage. Let's talk about protocol number two. Okay, I have no experience with PEDs. I've been clear on that. But from what I've seen and heard from those who have shared their experiences is that this type of protocol teaches you to need drugs to get into contest shape. You never learn the power of manipulating nutrition and training alone in contest prep. Never. You never really get the chance to learn your body. Look, if you want to add PEDs in later, that's totally up to you. But in the beginning, learn your body. You would be so surprised what just diet and exercise alone can do with consistency, violent consistency. I remember one time I was director of U.S. and international sales for a supplement company, and I was sent to the Body Power Show in England to meet with customers and potential customers. I remember chatting with this girl at the VIP dinner after the show and not realizing that she was a competitor. She honestly, and I don't mean this with disrespect, she genuinely looked like she didn't train. I almost fell off my seat when she told me she was an IFBB pro figure competitor and was planning to do a show in a few months. I was like, a few months? I'm thinking it's going to take you her a year or whatever to get back into shape alone. It was sad. She was she was self-conscious because she knew she didn't look like she competed and and she was honest about it with me. She was very forthcoming. So I asked her, how are you planning to get into shape? And contest shape, that is. And she goes on to list off things like clenbuterol, winstrol, and I don't know, some compound I can't remember. It was some sort of anabolic. She literally came out and said that using these compounds, okay, these compounds is the secret to her contest prep and she will be ready no problem. I don't remember seeing her on stage that season, so I really don't know what happened to her. So again, the moral of this is that starting off with PEDs doesn't teach you how to contest prep. It doesn't teach you how to dial in your physique for anything. Forget a contest. And lastly, protocol number three, probably the hardest protocol and not for reasons you think. Staying on plan isn't the issue. It's patience and violent consistency that's an issue. And it's only getting worse with social media and wanting everything immediately mentality. How many times have you left your phone aside, right? And someone sent you a text while you were away. They didn't get the immediate response. So they either text you again and ask if you got it. Or somebody sends you an email and then sends you a text or maybe even calls you because did you get my email? So, you know, we're, we're just in this society that is, is just looking for everything in media. For me, I'm currently in the protocol number three camp right now as I prepare for a show this spring and summer. I'm 18 weeks out from my goal and so far nothing dramatic is happening except maybe my waist is getting a little tighter. Cardio is still a couple days a week of 20 minutes of desaturation work. Lifting days are four to five. A couple weeks ago, calories were reduced, and I'm just this week starting to see a downward trend on the scale. And I don't really care about the number per se. The scale is one measure of improvement, and I'm just looking at it to see trends. I've been doing this for 20 years, so I know it's a patience game. And I don't freak out about not seeing big changes on the scale. I don't. There are a couple reasons for this. I learned from the very start how dramatic a small change in macros can have on body composition. The physique changes maybe don't happen right away, like they don't happen the day after you make the adjustment. And that can be frustrating for some, and they just give up before the magic happens or maybe want to do something more to try to expedite the process when they don't realize they just need to chill. Be patient. Hence the reasons for and the existence of protocols one and two, because people just don't want to do that. For me, after a macro adjustment, Small changes can occur in as soon as one week. And sometimes as I get down to a lower body fat level, a drop might not even happen for a couple of weeks. Body fat loss isn't linear. If you're trying to lose one to two pounds a week, it's an average. You might go weeks where you see no change and then a big drop. 
Many get frustrated and want to see immediate, immediate results, but don't realize that large swings in weight are likely to be more than just body fat, that they are most likely losing some of that hard-earned muscle they spend the rest of the year building. Slow and steady preps also keep stress levels in check. Once you get to the low body fat levels, there's no way around the stress it has on the body, but that's short-lived and remedied pretty quick when you dial out of a show to, you know, to a body fat level your body is much happier at. The key to having a great experience with contest prep really does come down to the protocol you use to get to the show. If you start off working with someone who starves you and puts you on a cardio machine for two hours prior to your first show on a pop-up stage in a budget hotel, you are less likely to have a healthy relationship with food after the show. If you work with someone who has some actual credibility regarding nutrition and you dial into a show over a longer and slower period that includes minimal cardio and the highest calories possible they feed you, you are more likely to dial out of a show without a massive rebound. You can really learn a lot about your body when you prepare for a show. I likened it to being like my own science experiment when I first started. I was just so fascinated by the changes that occur to the body, and, and I'm grateful. Okay, I'm grateful. I had a contest prep coach for my first bodybuilding show who didn't starve me. I mean, the diet itself was really bland, which created its own set of issues. And I honestly didn't learn until many years later that food doesn't have to suck to be on plan. But overall, keeping a slow and steady pace and having an overall positive relationship with food is key to deciding whether or not to do a show. Huge key. So as you can see, there's a lot more to consider if you're thinking about doing a show either for the first time or coming back into prep after a long layoff. Ask yourself, which protocol am I following? One, two, or three. If you're in the protocol one or two camp, I highly encourage you to reconsider competing. Not forever, okay? Just reconsider competing until you find someone that can help you in a way that will not wreak havoc on your mental and physical well-being. There are plenty of them out there. If you can look further than the amount of likes they have on social media and dive into their real credentials instead. Another thing to consider when determining if you're ready to do a show is that preparing for shows, regardless of what you think is going to happen, is all-consuming. You will need to find time to make workouts happen, even if your schedule changes. There will come a point, whether you're doing protocol one, two, or three, where you will need to be able to control what you eat more closely, so you are less likely to be able to eat out at restaurants. Your friends and family will miss hanging out with you. They will, at first, be excited for you that you want to do this thing in three to six months, but... They don't understand that just because they are bored with your contest prep doesn't mean you're going to go off plan. They don't understand that contest prep has a layering effect, that you aren't trying to lose some body fat to look good in a bathing suit. You are bringing your body fat level down to contest shape, which is far beyond just a hot body on the beach. What you do this week will determine what you look like the weeks ahead. There is no way to know if something is working if you don't keep it consistent and remove as many variables as possible. Consistency is key, even when it's boring. I've had many posing clients on the verge of divorces because of unsupportive spouses. This unsupportive home life can be challenging. The only way I've seen it work is, you know, when the, when the spouse is involved in the journey in some way. I'm lucky today with my current contest prep that my husband also aspires to compete and he cooks most of my food for me. I'm still in disbelief every time he says he made me some food. Like, who are you? My first husband was the opposite. He resented my competition lifestyle and it drove a wedge between us. Sharing the experience of contest prep with your significant other in some manner is very important. Oh, and remember, this is a hobby. There is no excuse for you to be a jerk to your spouse during contest prep because you are hungry. You are willingly doing this prep and they love you and they should be rewarded for putting up with you. Another thing I want to touch on to help you determine whether you should do a show is your expectations. I'll never forget the time I was casually talking to someone about contests and this person expressed interest in a show, but said he didn't want to compete unless he was going to win. <laughs> I was stuck for a moment. I'm like, dude, no matter how incredible you look and how hard you prepped, you can't control who shows up on stage. I mean, don't get me wrong. I always compete to win. I'm in it to win it. And I'm not, un I'm unapologetic about it. You don't put in the effort day in and day out for anything less than to bring your best package to the stage. And as you get closer and closer to the show, it's completely normal to not be sure if you will be ready and have doubts. Totally normal. And it's also why you, it's really good, no matter how many years you've been doing shows, to have an outside opinion that you trust who will monitor your progress when you jump on the crazy train. 
going into a show and expecting to win and un- it is really just unrealistic. Despite specific judging criteria, the judging itself, you guys, if you think about it, it's really just opinions. Some federations, in my opinion, my opinion, do a better job in their vetting process of their judges. So you will see a lot more consistency in the results. For example, the NPC and IFBB has judges on a local level that have to pass a test in order to judge a, lo- a show locally. Of those judges, there are ones that are better than others. The ones that are better are the ones that you will see judging the national shows. From there, you will have to really be a standout to judge pro shows. Often you will hear people complain that the show was political and there was favoritism on the judging panel when really there is a lot more to consider. What it comes down to is where you compete. And I mean both the division and the federation. Are you competing locally where some judges might be new to judging? Are you competing nationally where the judging is more refined and the criteria more dialed in? The judging panel on a local level might not have the level of consistency you see at larger shows. Also something to consider is that the same federation often has different judging panels based on region. You might fare better with one panel over another, especially in the bikini category. There are too many variables with judging. The level you are competing on, local versus national, and even the nuances between the federations and and what their judging criteria says. You can't put all your energy and faith into one show. There is just too much unknown about the day with things like who shows up to put all of your eggs in one basket. Plus, if you have an amazing physique and you show up a hot mess express on stage, aren't able to open your lats, can't hold your poses, bobble all over the place, you're costing yourself a higher placement especially as you get to the pro ranks and everyone looks amazing, which is part of the reason I designed the Posing Win Shows curriculum. And I even have a new one I'm about to launch called the Lat Whispers Essentials, which teaches you everything you need to know how to flare your lats and look effortless in the poses where you need lat engagement. Oh man, that's a big one. I've had to score people down as a judge because they couldn't flare their lats so they could not display symmetry. And this was a pro competition. Highly unacceptable. True story. And the last thing I want to touch on is if you are deciding whether you're ready to compete or not, big one, cost. Oh my God, you guys, this is not an inexpensive sport. Just the suits alone, I've heard people spend over $1,500, not because they needed to, but because they wanted to display their physique their best. Granted, you don't need to spend thousands on a custom suit, but you do get what you pay for. If you're broke, this is not the sport for you. You should not be allocating your rent money to your entry fees and skimping on things like hair and makeup at the show. Unless you're a hairdresser or a makeup artist, buy the hair and makeup packages. Don't try and do your own tan unless you've had a ton of practice at it and know what you're doing. These small things can make or break placements, especially as you get to the higher level. Maybe not so much at the local level, but then again, if everyone around you looks like a mess and you're put together, you will essentially stand out and look that much better. This is a sport about looks. Everything about your look matters. Your posture, your confidence, your hair, your skin color. Having a great physique will only get you so far. Don't skimp on the things that have to do with your presentation. And I mean all of it. How many times have you heard me say posing when shows? My goodness, you guys, so much money is wasted on the things you don't need and not enough allocated towards the things that are really going to matter. Start a savings account where you put money aside every month and wait until you have enough money to cover all the costs before you even consider doing a show. Mindset, focus, goals, relationships with nutrition and exercise, relationships with family and friends, your finances, all of these things need to be considered before preparing for a show. And this goes for not just new people, but you veterans too. Some of you have had some bad experiences. Really think about it before you plan your next show. Oh man, I touched on a lot of stuff today. My goal is for you to think about doing shows for the enjoyment of the sport and not go into competing and think it's going to solve any problems in your life. If anything, competing can add stress to an already stressful life. So I hope you take the things I shared to heart and really think about why you want to do a show. Guys, I hope you found this episode helpful and you share it with others that might need to hear some or one of the things I covered in this episode. As always, please rate and review so iTunes knows this is a cool podcast. And if you are on other platforms, I think you can only share the podcast, so be sure to spread the word. And stay tuned, guys. There's lots more to come. What are the things you need to know before competing in a bodybuilding competition? 
the Everything Else in Bodybuilding podcast is dedicated to taking out the guesswork in the industry and exposing all these strategies. Learn five things I think you should know before your next show by downloading your free ebook called Five Tips Every Competitor Needs to Know Before Your Next Competition at www.eeinbb.com. It's all the no-nonsense information you need, whether you are male or female, bodybuilder, physique, figure, bikini, or wellness competitor. It's free, so just go download my five tips every competitor needs to know before your next show at eeandbb.com.